Hey everyone, Charlotte here. I just wanted to give listeners a forewarning that this episode covers some pretty rough subject matter. We will be covering topics of child abuse, including sexual abuse, as well as subjects covering violence towards children. So we wanted to give you a quick trigger warning. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy. I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. First and foremost, we just want to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone for your support and your kind words about our first episode. We've been totally blown away by it. Yes, seriously, thank you guys so much for all the follows and the reviews. They really mean a lot to us, and we appreciate you all being a part of this with us. It means a lot to know how many people really believe in us. And today, we're going to be talking about a case that's fascinated both of us for years. We're going to be looking at the case of Mary Bell. This is a case that has captivated true crime fans for decades for a large number of reasons. The things she did were terrible, and her actions after her murders are just chilling. But what makes Mary Bell stand out is that she was only 10 years old when she committed her first murder. By the age of 11, she was responsible for the deaths of two toddlers. Mary was born on May 26, 1957, in Northumberland, England, to 17-year-old Elizabeth Betty McCricket. Betty lived an incredibly difficult life, and it was obvious that she was in no position to be a mother. She struggled with her mental health and often used alcohol to cope with the difficulties of her life. Like many unwed and expecting mothers at the time, Betty was taken to a mother and baby home to await the birth of her child. These homes were often run by the church. They were somewhere the young women could go until they gave birth to their child. Often, these children were given up for adoption, but that was not the case with Mary, despite Betty crying, take that thing away from me, upon her birth. It's unknown who her father was, but less than a year after she was born, her mother married Billy Bell, and Mary would take his last name as well. Billy Bell was a lifelong criminal with a history of robbery and alcoholism, who also had a daughter. They settled into a home at 70 White House Road in Scotswood, an area known for its high police presence in crime. The Bell family shared the neighborhood with many other families that had small children, and the children could often be seen playing outside with one another unsupervised until late at night. I remember playing outside until the street lights came on when I was little. It was a normal thing. That being said, this was kids that were toddler aged and they were allowed to be out and about without any adult supervision. Not to mention the fact that the area itself wasn't exactly safe for toddlers to be running around in. There were a lot of abandoned buildings and debris from houses that had been demolished and just left there. At this time, Betty continued to work as a sex worker. It is reported that the majority of her clients were interested in whipping, asphyxiation, and other forms of rough sex acts. Betty would also often leave for Glasgow for days at a time and would leave Mary with basically anyone who was willing to look after her. While she would often leave her with friends or family, she is reported to have once left her with a random woman she met outside of a pharmacy. One day, Mary's mom even went to an adoption agency with Mary. She saw a woman crying because she had been unsuccessful at adopting a child and just gave Mary to her. She told her that she was already bringing Mary there to be adopted, so she may as well just take her. Luckily, Betty's sister saw everything happen and followed the woman home and took note of her address. She told Betty that she saw what had happened and threatened to report her to the police if she didn't go back and get Mary. This is a woman who was denied an adoption and they knew nothing about, but I can't help but wonder if this random person would have actually been able to provide her a better home, especially with Mary's mother already setting the bar so low. Apparently this woman had a bunch of new clothes set aside for Mary and even let her keep them when her mom picked her up. Mary being left with other people was often a good thing. It became clear to those around them that Mary was being subjected to various forms of abuse. Mary once fell from a two-story window. Witnesses later reported that they saw Betty push her, but that was never fully confirmed. The fall caused an injury to her prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that is responsible for things like decision-making, reasoning, impulse control, and comprehension, amongst other things. People who have injured their prefrontal cortex can show irritability, aggression, and overall inappropriate emotional responses. These injuries are often seen in people who commit violent acts. This is something that we really see pretty often in people who kill, especially in people who kill more than one person. 
That was just one incident, too. Mary's childhood was terrible. She once got so sick that she had to have her stomach pumped. She told the doctor that her mother had given her Smarties. One of Mary's five-year-old friends also later reported that she saw her mother give her what she called Smarties in their backyard. Betty was also known to hit Mary often. There's also the heartbreaking fact that Betty would often sell Mary to her clients. Mary Bell endured abuse on a huge variety of different levels at the hands of multiple people. This can't be surprising considering what she was going through, but Mary had a very difficult time making friends. However, at the age of four, she was able to make friends with a little girl who lived in the same area as her. One day, they were playing outside, and Mary watched as one of her only friends was hit and killed by a bus not far from where she was standing. As Mary grew older and progressed in school, she gained a reputation as an unpredictable girl with a compulsion for lying. She would have uncontrollable mood swings where she would go from being calm one minute to being loud and violent the next with absolutely no provocation. Mary would get physical with the students, going as far as to have grabbed another child by the throat. As a result, some children would bully Mary while others were simply too afraid to play with her. We really can't go much further into this case without introducing Norma Bell. Norma, no relation to Mary, they just happen to have the same last name, lived next door to the Bell family. By the time they were 10 and 12, respectively, the two were inseparable. Although Norma was the older of the two, Mary was the one who was considered in charge in the friendship. Mary was also reported to have been way more intelligent than Norma, despite the age difference, and Norma would often go along with whatever Mary wanted. On May 11, 1968, 10-year-old Mary and 12-year-old Norma took a 3-year-old boy named John to the store to go and get some candy. Less than an hour after they left with him, Mary and Norma arrived at a pub with little John who was bleeding from a head wound. They claimed that they found him near some sheds that were outside. An examination upon the boy showed that he had most likely fallen off a ledge, but no further investigation was done and the girls did not get in trouble. Mary later admitted to pushing the boy off the ledge. The very next day, three girls, seven-year-old Pauline, six-year-old Susan, and six-year-old Cindy were attacked by Mary while playing at a sandbox. Mary apparently choked the three girls, and it was reported that she shoved sand down at least one of their throats. She then approached six-year-old Cindy and said, What happens if you choke someone? Do they die? She then choked Cindy until she turned purple. At least one of the mothers is said to have reported this to the police, but it was never investigated. Mary's violent behavior was escalating, and it didn't look like she was going to be stopped anytime soon. Martin Brown was a small, mischievous boy who was known for his laugh and happy demeanor. Martin lived with his family at 140 St. Margaret's Road. On May 25th, 1968, four-year-old Martin Brown would meet his end at the hands of Mary Bell. On that day, Martin woke up at his usual time of 6.30 a.m. It was a Saturday and his family, including his older sister Linda, were all sleeping in. He went downstairs for some cookies and milk and brought some upstairs for his sister. Martin then went outside to play. We've mentioned before that it was normal for little kids his age to go out and play without any adult supervision. At around 3 p.m., Martin was seen by his aunt when he came to her house asking for some change to go buy a piece of candy. He was seen leaving the store at around 3.15 p.m. The area near the store was kind of rough in the sense that it had a lot of abandoned houses and debris from houses that had been torn down. A lot of the kids were known to go and play in these houses. At 3.30 p.m., three little boys were exploring one of the buildings and on the second floor came across the lifeless body of Martin Brown. He was laying on his back with his arms stretched out. They yelled to some men who were working nearby and at 3.35 p.m. an ambulance arrived for Martin Brown. Mary and Norma were later reported to have been seen at the site a few minutes after his body had been discovered, but this wouldn't stand out to police until later. An attempt was made to resuscitate Martin, but it was too late. The body didn't have much in regards to the signs of struggle or violence, other than some blood and saliva around his mouth. But there was an empty bottle of painkillers found near his body. This led police to originally assume that the boy had died of an accidental overdose. An autopsy was performed on the body, but unfortunately no cause of death could be determined, which caused police to rule the death an accident. 
The police had reported that four-year-old Martin Brown had died of natural causes. You heard that right. They assumed that a four-year-old died of natural causes in an abandoned house. Yes, and this actually led to many protests from the people who lived in the area demanding to have these abandoned houses finally fully demolished. At these marches were Mary and Norma. The girls were reported to have been smiling and enjoying themselves the entire time. On May 26, Mary turned 11 years old. She celebrated with Norma at her house. Unfortunately, celebrations were cut short when Norma's father walked in on Mary strangling Norma's little sister. Norma's father shrugged it off as a game the kids were playing, and not much resulted from this. On the 27th of May, a preschool was broken into and vandalized. When police investigated, they found that nothing was stolen. The building had just been broken into to be vandalized. Four notes were also recovered. One of the notes read, I murder so that I may come back. Another read, Fuck off. We murder. Watch out, Fanny and... Homophobic term that I'm not going to repeat. And? We did murder Martin Brown. Fuck off, you bastard. And the last one was a little bit longer, but it really didn't make a ton of sense. It mentioned the murder of Martin Brown again with more insults. So, wow. Uh, These notes were obviously written by kids. There were a ton of errors in the notes, and the writing was barely legible. Due to Martin's death being ruled an accident, this was just written off as a prank done by mischievous neighborhood children. Mary's behavior over the next few weeks grew even more concerning. She would show up at Martin's house and talk to his mother. She would ask her how she was feeling, and if she was sad, and if she was crying over the loss of her son, all with a smile on her face and a creepy little giggle. She then started asking to see Martin. When his mother explained that she couldn't see him because he was dead, Mary replied, I know he's dead. I want to see him in his coffin. All with a smile on her face. Martin's mother finally closed the door and stopped communicating with Mary. If you've never seen a photo of Mary Bell, now would be the time to look her up. We're going to post some photos on our social media, but just um, go have a look at her picture and imagine her saying all of this. It's honestly the kind of stuff that horror movies are inspired by. On July 31st, only less than two months later, another child in the area died under mysterious circumstances. This one, in a more violent manner. Brian Howe was only three years old when he was last seen alive by his parents. He had been outside playing with his puppy. When it was time for dinner, his parents called out to him, but there was no response. They began to search the neighborhood, eventually being joined by numerous concerned neighbors, all eager to find the missing little boy. And who else could be seen helping search for Brian other than Norma and Mary? Once again, they were seen helping. Although, while those around them displayed an obvious concern at what was going on, the two girls could be seen smiling and laughing as if the whole thing was a game to them. Not only that, they were seen skipping around and singing. There's a search for a little boy going on, and you have these two little girls, who are known for being troublemakers, acting like it was the most fun thing ever. I can't tell if their behavior is horribly terrifying, or if people just thought they were two obnoxious troublemakers. But they stood out as being really inappropriate, and people started noticing. The search continued, and eventually the police were called and an official investigation was started. At around 11.10 p.m., the police located the body of Brian Howe at another site filled with large broken concrete slabs. He had been covered in weeds. Unlike Martin Brown, it was clear to police right away that this was a homicide. His neck was bruised and had scratches all over it. He also had scratches on his face. At the head of the investigation was Detective Chief Constable James Dobson, who immediately saw the similarities between this and the death of Martin Brown. One child found dead could be a coincidence, but two, especially considering this one displayed much more signs of aggression towards the victim. They began to explore the similarities between the two cases. If they were right and the same person had murdered both children, then whoever was doing it was escalating and could kill again. Detective Dobson also reported that the cuts on the body were most likely not done by an adult as there was not a lot of force used. The cuts did not appear to have been done with a lot of aggression. It looked like whoever had done them was doing it more out of curiosity. An autopsy was done on Brian Howe and it was concluded that he had died by strangulation between 3.30 and 4.30 p.m. that day. It was also noted that he had multiple scratches on his neck, compression marks on his nose, He had six marks on his thighs, and his genitals had been cut. All of these wounds were superficial and did not fully puncture the skin. Finally, it was noted that the letter M had been carved onto his stomach, most likely with scissors. 
Interestingly enough, they did actually write that the M was originally the letter N and that it had been changed after a period of time. The autopsy confirmed the earlier theory that the murder was done by someone who had used very little force due to the lack of severity in the wounds. The attacker was most likely a child. This was all the police needed to launch an investigation, and within 24 hours, they had already interviewed around 1,200 children in 1,000 homes, as well as questioned their parents. Out of these 1,200 children were Mary and Norma. They were originally visited multiple times because the answers that they provided the police with were not completely clear. Detective Dobson noted that the girls seemed to purposefully provide unclear answers and that they were acting like the entire thing was a game. Their stories changed often, and the answers that they did give just made them look even more suspicious. When confronted, they were evasive. After some questioning, Mary suddenly remembered something. On the day of the murder, she had seen an eight-year-old boy with Brian. She claimed that she had seen them hanging out and playing. She also said that the boy had hit Brian for what looked like no reason, and that she had also seen the boy playing with some silver scissors, and that he had been trying to hurt some animals with them. The small detail of the scissors set off alarms for the police. If you remember, the autopsy had shown that some of the cuts could have been done by scissors. There was also a pair of silver scissors that were found at the scene of the murder. However, the police had hidden both of those facts from the public. Only someone who had been there could have known that scissors were somehow involved. The police actually also confirmed that the boy, who she said she saw with Brian that day, had spent the entire day with his parents and couldn't have possibly been with Brian. So to recap, Mary had shared details that only she would have known, she refused to give a consistent story, and was very obviously treating the entire thing like it was a joke to her. The police didn't need much more than that to consider her a suspect. Anyone else who could have been remotely involved was cleared of all suspicion at this point, and only the two girls remained. On August 4th, 1968, Norma was interviewed once again. She had told them that she was playing with her siblings during the time that Brian disappeared. However, this contradicted some of the statements given by other children that were questioned. Many of them had told the police that they had seen the girls playing together that day. Once confronted, Norma told the police that she had lied and that she was with Mary that day. She also told them that Mary had taken her to see Brian. At that point, Norma filed an official statement saying that Mary had taken her to see the body of Brian Howe that day. She said that Mary had confessed to the murder and that she strangled the boy and even claimed that Mary told her she enjoyed it. She showed her a razor she had and she hid it under a concrete block and made Norma promise not to tell anyone. That evening, Norma took the police to where Mary had hidden the razor. Sure enough, it was exactly where she had claimed it was going to be. On August 15th at 12.15 a.m., three police officers arrived at the Bell home to bring Mary in for questioning. She was very defensive with the police and did not cooperate. She even threatened to call herself a lawyer. I find it interesting that this little 11-year-old girl not only knew to say that, but knew to use it as a threat. This tells us how smart Mary really is. It was also reported that when the police told her that Norma had showed them where the razor was, Mary immediately threatened to kill her. The police questioned Mary, but unfortunately still didn't have all the evidence to officially arrest her with the murder. A lot of the information that they had was still going off of what Norma had said, and Norma was not really considered to be a trustworthy source. Detective Dobson also ended up attending the funeral of Brian Howe to see if anyone suspicious was there. Of course, Mary Bell was there. Detective Dobson is quoted as saying, Mary Bell was standing in front of the Howe's house when the coffin was brought out. I was watching her, and it was when I saw her there that I knew I dare not risk another day. She stood there laughing and rubbing her hands. I thought, my God, I've got to bring her in. She'll do another one. Uh, he planned to arrest both girls that afternoon. He brought in Mary first, who originally tried to blame Norma for the murder. She claimed that Norma strangled Brian while Mary tried to stop her. However, Norma wouldn't stop and began to scream at her. She claimed that Norma, in a fit of anger, threw Brian, and that was when he died. During the interview, Martin Brown was brought up. The two cases shared a lot of similarities, and the police had suspicions that at least one of the girls had been involved in that murder, too. He also told Mary that he suspected her and Norma of breaking into the preschool, and that he believed that they left the notes. Mary admitted to this, but again blamed Norma. Detective Dobson soon had enough evidence to arrest both Mary and Norma for the murder of Brian Howe. 
By August 21st, 1968, the investigation into the murder of Martin Brown was fully completed. Because the girls were being housed in custody, someone was sent to their school to collect their assignments and paperwork. Upon looking at these assignments, it was clear that the handwriting on the notes that were left at the preschool matched the schoolwork. It even appeared that the girls tried to hide their writing by alternating between writing the notes. This confirmed that it had been the two girls who had broken in and vandalized the preschool. Not only that, they even found a notebook with a story written about Martin Brown and little pictures where Mary had drawn his body. She even included a little bottle of pills with the word tablet written on it. The pill bottle being found at the scene was never released to the public. The police also found, like with Martin Brown's mother, Mary had spoken to the house a few times, even telling them that Norma had strangled him. The fact that he died by strangulation was another detail that the police had hidden from the public. Upon further investigation, fibers matching a dress that Mary owned were found on both of the victim's bodies. Fibers from a dress that Norma owned were also found on the body of Brian Howe. At this point, both girls were officially charged with the murder of Martin Brown. On December 5th, 1968, the trials began. It was something that most people had never seen. Two young girls being charged for the murders of two even younger little boys. The public almost immediately labeled Mary as guilty. It was Norma that they were unsure about. Remember Mary's mother, Betty? She was at the trial too, and she didn't help. It was reported that she would regularly interrupt the proceedings and cause scenes in the courtroom. She was often heard loudly sobbing and would storm out and then loudly come back into the courtroom. I can only imagine how the loved ones of Brian and Martin felt about this. Norma's situation was a little bit different. She was the third of 11 children, and her family seemed a lot more sympathetic and understanding of her situation. She would react to evidence in a way that the court deemed appropriate, unlike Mary. Norma actually looked nervous and scared in court. Despite the age difference, she was looked at as a lot more childlike, and it seems as if she earned the sympathy of those in the courtroom, whereas Mary came off as completely unremorseful and unaffected by the situation that she found herself in. It was also clear that Mary appeared much more intelligent than Norma. She was able to quickly answer questions and come up with a response, whereas Norma struggled. The court was quick to separate the girls and began to view Norma as the more innocent of the two. It was clear to everyone involved that Mary was unlike other 11-year-old girls. She was evaluated by numerous psychiatrists. The majority of them agreed that she did display psychopathic tendencies. On December 14th, Norma Bell was acquitted of all charges on the basis that she was manipulated into doing these things by Mary. It was concluded that she likely didn't understand what she was doing and couldn't grasp the weight of her actions. Mary, however, was convicted of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility due to her symptoms of psychopathy. The judge described her as very dangerous and that she posed a very grave danger to other children. Mary was sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's Pleasure, which basically means that they get to keep her for as long as they feel like they need to. A case like this would be shocking if it happened in 2022, but in 1968, this was something that was completely unheard of, and the judicial system was kind of unsure about what to do with Mary. The psychiatric institutions around were not equipped enough to handle her, and there were no places that she could go with other dangerous young female offenders. She was unable to live with other troubled children because she was too much of a risk to them. The idea that Mary could kill again was on the forefront of their minds. Eventually, Mary was sent to a place called the Red Bank Community Home, which interestingly enough housed one of the killers of James Bulger, a case that we may discuss later in the future. The Red Bank Community Home remained a secure housing facility for dangerous children until its closure in 2015. Red Bank Community was originally an all-boys facility, but because of Mary, it was changed to co-ed. Mary would often get visits from her mother Betty. Mary would often appear happy and excited to see her mum. Unfortunately, it is hard to say if these visits did more bad than good for Mary, as she was often reported to be extra aggressive and agitated after her mother had visited. Betty also found a way to make a profit out of her child being a killer. She would get Mary to write her notes, poems, and letters, and she would sell these for a profit. She would often speak to tabloids and appear to enjoy the attention she was getting. Mary actually made 50,000 pounds for one of her stories. When we say that Betty found a way to profit off of the situation, we mean it. There was a fair bit of money being made. When asked, Mary would almost always blame her mother for the situation she found herself in. She would say that her mother ruined her life. 
Betty would later blame the arguments between her and her husband for Mary's behavior. At 16 years old, Mary was transferred to Moore Court Open Prison, an open concept minimum security prison where the inmates were actually allowed such privileges as leaving the ground for their jobs. The inmates' rooms were not locked and they were allowed to roam the grounds as they pleased. At the age of 20 years old, Mary added prison escape to her resume and ran off to allegedly lose her virginity to a guy she knew. As punishment, she received 28 days without her usual privileges, but the tabloids absolutely ate this news up. It was everywhere. Newspapers read, Two Nights of Freedom with Mary Bell, and talked about how child killer Mary Bell had escaped prison to have sex with someone. The Mary Bell case is still talked about to this day for a number of reasons. It isn't surprising as to why. Not only were two toddlers murdered, they were killed by two young girls. That being said, one of the most shocking things regarding this case happened afterwards. In 1980, 23-year-old Mary Bell was released from prison. Not only that, Mary was given a completely new identity in an effort to provide her with a new life away from the press. That didn't stop the tabloids from tracking her down numerous times and harassing her. She moved several times to escape them, but they would always find her in the end. In 1984, on the 16th anniversary of Martin Brown's murder, Mary Bell gave birth to a little girl. The little girl was granted anonymity until she reached adulthood at 18. Mary originally had no intention of telling her daughter about her past. However, the tabloids found them again when her daughter was 14 years old, and they were forced to flee their home, hiding their faces with bedsheets. This poor girl. Can you imagine? You're 14 years old, and you just found out that by the time your mom was 14, she had already been charged for murders that she had committed years before. I'm not really sure how Mary thought she could hide this from her daughter. At the end of the day, her name was changed, but the tabloids would always find them and take photos of them. I'm not really sure why it didn't occur to her that her daughter could go her entire life without finding out. I can't even imagine how that conversation would go, but I really wonder what kind of mom Mary was. In an effort to protect her daughter, Mary Bell petitioned that the anonymity would be granted to her daughter for the rest of her life. They ended up granting this for her, and both her and her daughter have lifelong anonymity. No one is supposed to know anything about them, including their names or where they live. Mary Bell became a grandmother in 2015 at the age of 58. The child will also have lifelong anonymity. The order that protects them is now called the Mary Bell Order, which is a court order forbidding publication of any information that could identify a child involved in legal proceedings. Mary Bell will be turning 65 this year. As far as we know, she still resides in the UK, but because she lives under the protection of the British government, there's a pretty big chance that we won't hear anything about her until after she dies, if we even do then. I can't even begin to imagine how the family of the victims feel about this. As for Norma, as far as we can see, she was acquitted and then just sent back to live her life. And that's the story of Mary Bell, convicted killer of two who served 12 years and now lives her life as a free woman. You cannot argue that what she did was absolutely evil, but was she born that way or did the actions of her mother cause her to become a killer? Uh, maybe it was both. Let us know what you guys think. I personally don't think she stood much of a chance to begin with. Mind you, of course people can overcome what they are born into, but I think it was a horrible combination of so many different things. She was born into poverty, abused in so many different ways, and don't forget that she did have damage to her brain due to the fall. The fall that was probably caused by her mother. At the same time, Betty was so young when she had her and she also had a terrible life, so it sounds to me like a horrible cycle of abuse and trauma that I hope Mary was somehow able to break with her kids, but who knows. I completely agree. I don't think she had a chance right from birth. This is definitely a case for nurture over nature, and then coupled with the frontal lobe injury at such a young age, she checks off the boxes that many, many other killers do. It's so unusual to see a young female killer, though. I have to say, I I'm pretty torn on whether she should have remained incarcerated her entire life, or if she really is a true example of someone that has been rehabilitated. I'd be very curious to know where Norma ended up, if she ended up living a regular life or, you know, new friends to lead her. And that brings us to the end of this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. And for those of you who are familiar with her, we hope you were able to learn something new. Child killers are both terrifying to think about, but also tragic in their own way. It really brings up the question of whether or not someone can be born evil.
Make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm Dina V on Twitch, Dina V Tweets on Twitter, and Dina V IG on Instagram. And I'm Ominous underscore Walrus on Twitter and Ominous Walrus on Instagram. If you really like this episode, please consider giving us a five-star review. That would be super cool of you. You should definitely do that. Thanks for listening. This has been The Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.